Good morning. It's uh, 10 a.m. and it's time to start the CareCast. Produced by the Knowledge and Evaluation Research Unit at Mayo Clinic, these CareCasts are conversations with people who help care fit in the lives of patients. Today, I, we are extremely lucky. Uh, today, we have our, our, uh, as our guest, uh, Carolyn Ganfield. Carolyn, um, when uh, uh, Carolyn is a scholar in the Innovation Support Unit and an adjunct professor at the Department of Family Medicine at the University of British Columbia, and when one starts an introduction in those terms, one would imagine that Carolyn is a traditional academic that uh, has joined the ranks of uh, of academic healthcare to make you know to make a contribution. But Carolyn uh, is a citizen patient, is a uh, community organizer, uh, is an advocate for patient safety, and is a partner to healthcare organization and academic institutions seeking to move forward in these areas. Uh, uh, Carolyn and I met uh, uh, by many, by, by, uh, by all accounts, by chance, um, and um, uh, it, it's been a transformative encounter among the, the long curriculum of collaborations and contributions that Carolyn has, um, I am particularly most proud uh, of uh, accounting Carolyn as one of the founding fellows of the Patient Revolution, an organization for advocacy and action that's trying to turn away from industrial healthcare uh, into careful and kind care for all. Um, Carolyn, welcome to the CareCast. Thank you so much, Victor. It is such a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a real privilege and a real honor. And I'm just delighted that we get a chance to talk for an hour. How often does that happen? <laughs> <laughs> Phenomenal. Um, Carolyn, I, I, I like, you know, often these conversations start with, you know, this, you know, story of your life, introduction. But I'm particularly interested, as you know, in the way in which people become who they are. <laughs> How do how did you become you? Well, you know, it, it, it's uh, it, nature and nurture is usually the way, you know, we, we frame this. And, or was it luck or was it by design? Um, of course, it's, it's it, you know, you, you begin to see patterns only on retrospect. Um, if I go back to the six-year-old me, uh, you know, I, I don't think I would have seen a very uh, bright light ahead. I mean, at, you know, I, it, it, I had no idea. Um, so how do I become who I am? Um, I was one of four children, and uh, I'm told that at a tender age, uh, long before six, I had a very strong sense of justice, right and wrong. Now, I don't know how much that was competing uh, with my peers, but it was really a, a broader sense of justice. It wasn't about getting my part. It was that things had to be fair. And uh, as I try to you know, create a theme, I'm now 70 years old, if I try to create a theme for what's been a motivating drive, it is something about social justice and fairness. It's, it's um, a kind of naive uh, uh, expectation. And when I don't see it, I am deeply offended. And I, I feel like I can't sit still without trying to do something about it. So, you know, I think about all kinds of, of uh, activities and it was, you know, I guess early on to try to find my voice and I struggled. I was an extremely shy person, um, couldn't stand up in front of a room of my peers and open my mouth and, you know, that's hard for anybody to believe now. But um, yeah, I think finding my voice was the first thing, finding that I mattered and then finding that my voice could make a difference in the world. In no, some yeah, ho hold on. So, so uh, this idea of finding your voice, finding that you matter, uh, you know, I'm struck by the, uh, by the narrative that um, extraordinary people are the ones that matter, right? Uh, that this once in a million years type of uh, larger than life folks that are the ones that can make a difference. Um, um, how does one, did you, how did you discover you were one of these extraordinary people? Well, uh, first of all, I don't think of myself that way. I, I don't. I don't think that's what leadership is about. I mean, um, my voice articulates what others believe and feel, and that's 
I mean, that's, that's where importance is um, to, to establish the fact that we are all connected, that there is a common thread amongst us. And I think that's, that's the basis for a civil society. Um, that's, that, and, and then exploring through that kind of dialogue uh, what it is to be having something in common. Um, and I think in terms of healthcare, the whole uh, dichotomy between the patient view and the professional view just seems so arbitrary. The more I meet people who are health professionals, the more I meet a variety of patients and patient experiences and explore attitudes in the public. You know, we are all in this together and it, to, to, uh, where, we, where we find conflict or clashes or different philosophies, it really, to me, it's, it's a mistaken belief. We make assumptions about the other. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so- well, But, it, but it's, it's fascinating that, yeah. that you use, that, that uh, you say that the, the role of the leader um, is to articulate I think so. Is to articulate what others are feeling and experiencing. Did I get that right? Well, I, I, I think that that's part of it. And, you know, it's very nice to have someone say something you're thinking. You know, I mean, it's, there's an, excuse me, there's an attraction in that. There's no doubt about it. Um, but, and, and we don't want to feel alone in the world. We want to feel as though um, we do have things in common with our, with our peers or with others. Uh, and I think establishing that is really, I mean, that's the basis of all the concepts of equity and representation and, and um, uh, I mean, so humility, I mean, humility is the other part of it. I, I think um, the only way you learn is by listening. And I think that one of the, the greatest practices that I have to work on that I do have to work on is listening carefully, really, really listening, um, hearing the ideas, the voices um, uh, that may be quite intimidated, that may be very much in the background, that may be um, largely invisible, uh, and having an appreciation of the huge diversity of experience. Um, yeah, there's a lot of arrogance to go around in the world, and I don't want to be a part of that. Uh, you know, this... So, so our articulation with humility, um, uh, articulation of the feelings and thoughts of others with humility, and then having the, the word with it all, not only just to articulate, but also to step up to the front of the line in representation of those voices. That's the... Uh, when, when, I, when I faced the challenge in my life's the narrative of, of should I get involved in healthcare and try to make a difference, um, what I recognized in myself as uh, a skill I could bring to the, the project was that I'm, I, I'm not afraid of pushing doors open. You know, I have found uh, the confidence to ask to be led in the room and to be sometimes quite aggressive about you need a patient there you you know you need that point of view in the room and then <laughs> being on very best behavior to ensure that i create a good experience for the others and don't besmirch the reputation of patients mm -hmm. uh, but to then be in that alien environment because for me healthcare was a totally unknown world and then be that sponge listen 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 and see if I could make sense, see if I could find a way of understanding this other culture, understanding this, this um, new atmosphere, this new way of behaving. Uh, so uh, the confidence that I have for public speaking and all that sort of stuff is, is really uh, an opportunity to, um, to, to go into uh, um, a world that isn't my own. Um, and to be able to speak for those who aren't with me in there, you know, to, to be able to take the voices of others with me. Uh, and I don't, you know, uh, as a patient advocate or a citizen patient, I actually have precious few patient experiences. But what I advocate for is to getting more people in the room who have a wealth mm. of experience, who how, have- How, how, you how do you, how, so, so you, you didn't develop this in healthcare, you brought it into healthcare. How, how do you become an activist? Is that outside of healthcare? 
Oh yes, um, <laughs> you know, uh, I think, um, I, I, I mean, it goes back to sort of becoming an adult and, and uh, in university years, I think um, the discovery that, uh, that people would listen to me if I, you know, if I had something to say. And uh, that was a revelation. It wasn't until I was, uh, you know, nearly an adult did I, did I find the confidence that um, saying what was on my mind uh, with respect and uh, getting over the shyness, the, the inability to, to stand up, um, to find that, that uh, empowerment, uh, you know, that, my God, you know, people, people thought that what I said was all right. So uh, developing then rather rapidly a sense of um, not only inside could I be, you know, could I have ideas that I thought were, were worthy, but if I, if I spoke, um, I could share those ideas and people were interested. They were interested in discussion. It wasn't, you know, Carolyn, you're right. It was, hey, what about this? And, you know, testing and, and developing um, a way of listening, a way of incorporating, a way of rearticulating ideas, of broadening my understanding. What, and what a, what a fabulous duality, right? Because on the one hand, you are finding your voice and your ability to make a difference through it. On the other hand, discovering at perhaps at a later point that that voice's job is to articulate uh, the feelings of others with humility and bring them into rooms uh, to which they have not had access yet. So it's an interesting duality of, of, of finding that your voice is to represent other voices. So I think, you know, the, this concept of community, a virtual community or a physical community, a geographic community, was something that I guess I kind of tossed off for most of my life. Uh, sure, I know what a community is. It's that feeling of commonality, where you belong, uh, people like you, people with common, commonly situated interests or values. I didn't have any idea until I moved to a small island community, a community of 750 people off the coast of British Columbia. And uh, I was 38 years old. I was there with my sweetie. We had a fantastic possibility for a self-indulgent life. But there in that population was a... Uh, uh, issue of, of public concern. It was a, a monumental battle between a community's self-determination about land use and uh, Canada's largest owner of private property, a forest company who decided they wanted to become a real estate developer. Well, how could I not get involved, you know? Um, and then I guess, you know, it was, the, it was cur I was curious about it. it was a whole area I knew nothing about. And I guess that's thinking about uh, lifelong, lifelong traits, curiosity is certainly right up there at, at the top. I was curious, you know, who, not only, you know, who are these people I live around, but what is it that they're so agitated about and what are the principles behind it? Um, and the, the, I guess the tipping point for me in understanding community was understanding when there is a crisis or a demand that everybody, no matter what their political stripe or values, you, you put that aside and you work for the common good. Um, we had a forest fire on our island, uh, wildfire. And uh, it was, I was working as a volunteer fire dispatcher. It was extraordinary to see the people who came to the fire hall and said, you know, I've got a chainsaw, I've got a pickup truck, where can I go? Or I can make sandwiches. How do I do this? I can help drive the truck. Uh, no, you can't. You aren't trained yet, but, you know, come in here. Yes, there are things you can do. So, um, and that's a dramatic example, but there are all kinds of examples where you realize that on this little island, the, the physical capacity, the amount of groundwater, the tree cover, the, the, uh, uh, the physical limits, natural resources, uh, uh, are, are delimited by that high tide line. That's all you got. That's all there is. But also the social resources. Mm. The social resources are defined by the people within the community. And you find um, ways of developing uh, tolerance for each other, 
discovery from each other, sharing from each other to create better lives generally. And you see it was a population where there were quite a lot of kids, young families, and lots of retired people. So becoming acquainted with the life cycle. Uh, I was most moved, I think it was only maybe two months after we, we arrived, there was a big birthday party on the island. And it was for a longtime resident who was turning 100. And I don't think that this had happened before. And it was an island party. It was in the largest room on the island, the school gymnasium. And it was all decorated. And Alice was in a party dress. And it was just amazing. And uh, of course, the, the variety of islanders, the variety of human specimens that were in the room was extraordinary. And the most moving moment was Alice being presented with a US silver dollar that was minted in the year of her birth as she held a newborn infant. And to see a century of life in this person and, and this, this extraordinary baby, and she gave the silver dollar to the infant. I mean, that's what she wanted to do. It was part of a ritual. I, I was just, I was so moved. So um, in living in this community as it, as it grew from 750 in 1987 to uh, now around 1,000, uh, 1,100, um, still very small place uh, with, with some of the same stresses, the same challenges, uh, uh, it taught me what community is. And people, I got involved in lots of public affairs and people would say thank you. They would take me aside and, you know, when no one else was listening and, and thank me, it was, it's the most meaningful gratitude I've ever experienced. And I think it's because in a small community, these dynamics are boiled down to very visible elements. It's easy and, and to it, see. It, it's amazing how it uh, turned out to be a training ground yeah. uh, to, to a great extent, it sounds like. Um, to equip you to deal with a community that is not geographically bound, but is bound by experience, which is the community of patients. But before we go into that, um, you, you proposed at the beginning that it's, you know, with nature or nurture, where there is chance or design. It sounds like, um, to some extent, there was, there's been a lot of, um, there's been a certain commitment to a particular you know, way of living that you've made that seems less, less a chance thing and more about an exercise of your own agency? Uh, or do you still see a huge role for chance in how you ended up uh, in the roles and, and in, 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 as a citizen patient now? Well, I, I guess in the way I've chosen to live, it's been very self-determined. You know, I've, I've seen the possibility of, of a door opening and said, gee, that's, that's interesting. I wonder what it's like over there. And uh, as, a, uh, as, a, 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 as a young person at 21, when I uh, graduated from Little Grinnell College in the middle of Iowa, I had the bright idea. I was an American studies major and uh, I was born in the US and, and raised in the US and went to school in Iowa. And uh, as an American studies major, it, I'd learned a lot about why the United States is the way it is uh, through its history, political science, literature, sociology, and so on. And I was really curious about why Canada and Australia weren't more similar, because there were a lot of the same elements that were themes in that academic program. And I decided that I wanted to see why. I wanted to, on the ground, encounter uh, Canadian culture and Australian culture uh, with that direct encounter. So, I mean, imagine my parents thinking it was okay for me as a 21 year old to set off on what would be a 18 month and 40,000 mile trip, uh, living in my car, um, you know, being totally alone in a country where I knew no one, knew no one, uh, driving from Vancouver Island through Newfoundland. And, uh, uh, you know, I fell in love with the, the, smaller size of the country, the more humane um, environment even then, and, uh, uh, and decided that this, this was a place that fit me. So 
you know, I, I directed myself into the unknown with uh, strong values and a open mind and enormous curiosity. Uh, met people, encountered landscapes, um, learned about the literature, learned about the arts, learned about uh, the political history uh, and the history of conflict and uh, aggression and um, exploitation. Uh, lots, you know, a very, a very rich and rounded uh, understanding and encountered racism, encountered um, uh, ugly sides of, uh, of a society. And, uh, uh, and, and yet I thought this is, this is a place this is a place that I can can make my home, and so I, I did immigrate, and uh, as soon as I could, I became a citizen, sh uh, so I could vote. But, you know, so you can say, well, there's there's a lot of self will in that. But then, you know, you I put myself, and I can see analogies at every scale. You know, it's like fractals. Uh, it might be this afternoon, and it might be a lifetime, um, of of putting myself in the deep end, jump in the deep end take the opportunity to go where you kind of don't know what you're doing in a new subject area, a new um, environment, uh, a new social group. And, and that takes courage, you know, to, to jump into that unknown, but then listen, 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 you know, look for patterns, look for ways of understanding, look for ways of connecting up ideas that can twist preconceptions can change and explore new areas. And, and to me, that's life. Um, I mean, that's the excitement of being alive. Uh, doing that and then sharing some of those ideas with people who know far more than you do and testing, you know, does that make any sense? Is this a new you idea? No, it, it's phenomenal. And, um, uh, and folks who are in the live broadcast are expressing their their massive and not only endorsement of what you're saying, but their admiration <laughs> for it. I, I think it's very clear uh, if I if I got this right that first of all you you had the choice we all have, which is simply not get involved, but you do. You choose to get involved. Number two, you choose to get involved, animated by curiosity. Mm. You want to know what it's about. I was just saying that um, you know there were a number of things that uh, that seem in the conversation thus far been driving you, curiosity being one of them, humility being another. But I was wondering if there was one thing that, um, that, 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 that drives you today, if, if we were to choose one, arbitrarily as, as that is, what would be the one thing that, uh, that drives Carolyn Cantor? Well, um, I guess making a difference and, and making a difference in the world, uh, having some small influence in connecting, connecting up people. Uh, enabling people to see common ground. And um, uh, I think as we get older, uh, there must be something organic about this because I don't feel like I kind of consciously went through a process of saying, oh, I wanna make a difference in the world. Uh, that seems pretty arrogant. But um, when I found myself uh, suddenly a widow and uh, 58 years old, um, <laughs> You know, it, it was an opportunity. <laughs> I know it sounds rather strange, but um, uh, my my husband was uh, was my world was uh, you know filled a big part of my life, and um, we we had a, a remarkable relationship and uh, deeply fulfilling to us both. And suddenly, with his absence, uh, there was a lot of room in in my life, and. Um, I, I struggled with grieving. Uh, I think I still struggle with grieving. Um, and I, I looked to a lot of wiser people than me who had written about um, major trauma, major changes in life uh, and how one adapts. And uh, I, I suppose I, I had always known about it, but I'd never read Viktor Frankl's Men's Search for Meaning. And uh, with, a, with a title like that, you know, how can you, you not go there? And uh, it's, a, it's a small book, but it's full of um, insights that are uh, adaptable. And, you know, he, he said, uh, don't, don't look for happiness. Instead, um, you will encounter it if you either devote yourself to something outside of you, something greater than yourself, or if you 
surrender yourself to uh, a, another person. Well, I'd done that in the sense that I had a, an extraordinary partnership uh, that was that was uh, uh, about sharing and togetherness and uh, delighting the other person uh, and and such joy. Um, so I I counted my lucky stars that I'd had that experience and I thought, all right, so what about this idea of devoting myself to something else? And I had so many questions that had poor answers um, uh, about the circumstances of, of my husband's death. And they weren't questions about medicine as much as they were about the way people treated each other in medicine. Uh, uh, you write about cruelty and uh, cruelty towards patients. And what I saw was immense cruelty within healthcare. Uh, the care staff that had looked after Nick were devastated by his unexpected death. And that shocked me. I thought, boy, if anybody copes with death, it's people who do this stuff for a, a living. And Nick and I were 20 years apart in age, and we'd talked about death for the 30 years we were together. Um, 35 years. Uh, and, you know, we, we lived in this community where people are born and people die. Uh, how could it be in healthcare that there was, that I arrived at the hospital with these sobbing nurses who were inconsolable? And then the thing that really, I mean, I had compassion for them, of course. Nick was a charming man. He was gone. But he'd had a wonderful life. And I told them that. Uh, but what really frosted me was that, um, uh, they were abandoned. They were expected 15 minutes later to meet their next patient and to invest emotionally in that patient just as they had with my husband. And uh, when I went back in the hospital a couple of weeks later, I saw one of the nurses I knew and she said, oh, I'm so sorry uh, to, to hear about your husband. And I said, I said how'd you find out? You know, <laughs> like, I it was a little bit hard boiled, I guess, but uh, so how'd you find out? And she said, oh, I think it was in the nurse's lounge we were talking. And, and I thought, oh, this is outrageous. How can you treat people like this? You ask them to, I mean, they have chosen a caring profession, a giving pr profession to help people who are suffering. And they devote themselves to, with great knowledge and great uh, skill to enable people to recover or tolerate those, those symptoms that cause such suffering. And then when you've established that relationship of caring and, and the rewards of caring, you ignore that at the time of, of loss and crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, so the emotional violence in, in that really upset me. And, and I just, it made no sense to me at all. Everything I knew about medicine was about excellence. And in fact, uh, the reaction, the medical reaction to Nick's death was not to be curious. And I thought, this, is, this doesn't fit my mental model. How have I gotten through half a century of life and I'm so wrong about medicine? I've always, and, and I come from you know, the 1950s of having deep respect for the doctor, the hierarchical view. Uh, medicine is magic here, these antibiotics and these vaccines that cure childhood polio, gone, you know, diphtheria, gone. Um, it, that was in my childhood. Those things happen. And I, I had such respect for the doctor, such respect for medical knowledge. And then I discover that behind that facade of authority and knowledge and deep commitment to, to alleviating suffering, here is this engine that is creating burnout. You could not create a better mechanism for burning out people who have chosen this extraordinary way to, uh, to, to have a role in society. So it took me about 18 months and chewing over Viktor Frankl's idea uh, to look in the mirror and say, uh, again, the Rabbi Hillel uh, saying that we, we use, we, I guess, hack, hack up a bit. Uh, if not now, then when? And if not me, then, then who? You know, it, so here I had this, this comfort uh, with mm, uh, facing power, this curiosity, this, this self-confidence to get in the room, the humility that I know I don't know anything. I know nothing about medicine. I've observed things that are 
odd, but I know nothing about healthcare. So knowing that all through my life, jumping in the deep end, if someone throws me a life ring, that's great. If not, I'll dog paddle around and make my way over to the side of the pool and then get back in the, in the deep water again. So I thought, you know, it, I don't have responsibility for others. Uh, my husband and I didn't have children, uh, and I, I, didn't, <laughs> I, I didn't have anything that would prevent me from devoting myself in the very intense way that I can. Well, to, it, it seems, Carolyn, you've, you've figured out the way to answer uh, Martin Luther King, uh, this idea of life's most persistent and urgent question, isn't it? Because, you know, it, that question was, um, what are you doing for others? And well, it seems like you found you found a way to answer that uh, as a matter of of, of your life course. Um, I I think the reward of doing things for others speaks to one. I don't think you can choose that. I, I don't think you can say, okay, to, from from now on, I'm going to do things for others. Um, I, I think it's you you develop that. Maybe it's intrinsic. I don't know. Um, but but having a sense of of justice again that you know other mm. people are not as fortunate as you or you see wrong that you want to write or at least have some influence in. But um, uh, I, I did, you mentioned Martin Luther King Jr. and I, I had a chance to meet him. Um, I was 17 years old. I was not eight weeks into my college experience at Grinnell and there was a, a great celebration of the founding of the college that uh, brought people in from all over and the, the crowning glory was uh, inviting Dr. King to give a sermon on the final Sunday of a week of extraordinary cultural and, and uh, uh, intellectual discussion um, with, with stars from all over. And um, I went early to the auditorium. I was there before anyone else to the gymnasium and uh, waited, 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 waited. The crowd filled, waited, waited. Dr. King was late. His flight was late to Marshalltown, not too far away. And uh, then the entourage arrived. And um, I wasn't brought up in a, in a church. Uh, and this was a sermon. And uh, the title of, of the sermon was um, something about sleeping through a revolution. And there are uh, uh, various forms that you can find now of, of this sermon because he adapted it and, and adapted this theme. And uh, I was spellbound. I was, I was, uh, was in, well, I was in his spell. I, I was captivated by his ideas and what he challenged his audience uh, full of young people and lots of, of older people and some of these celebrities from earlier in the week, great writers or, or great artists uh, were also in the audience. And he said, you know, that be alert, see what's going on. Don't be sleeping through a revolution. And this idea of, again, curiosity and agency, uh, it was a call to action that was very powerful. This was 1967. Six months later, he was assassinated. He was gone. And 1968 was a year that we're all recalling uh, this year in 2020 as uh, a time of great upheaval. Um, and it was in that cauldron of uh, civil rights, of international adventure in Vietnam, of uh, the voice of, and rights of the individual and uh, accountability uh, for those in authority. Uh, this was an extraordinary time to be 17, 18, 19, 20 years old. And I think uh, this, this idea of, um, of responding to a call to action with, with, again, the humility, with deep understanding about our limitations and not being fearful of how you may be shaped mm. in the course of that, uh, that adventure um, and not losing sight of why you're there. Uh, I, I mean, there's a, there's something I've observed, and I'm sure you have too, Victor, of, of founder syndrome. You know, you find somebody who's, you encounter someone in life who is a really great leader and a great innovator, um, a person that others want to be close to, uh, a, a person with charisma. 
and they create new things, uh, new structures, new organizations, political movements, whatever. And, um, and it, they're very popular and they, ha they have a momentum and they grow and they mature. And then what very often happens, in fact, maybe it's a rule, I haven't read about this, but it's a thought that I have. I'm sure other people have thought much more and written about it. Uh, that the person who has what it takes to create an entity hangs on past their best buy date, past the time mm. in which they're effective. Yes. They're tied to an original concept that in fact has evolved under their feet, has evolved around them, and they haven't been aware of that evolution, that adaptation. Mm -hmm. that, that groups or movements or institutions have. And for a founder to step away at what looks like the peak of achievement is a very difficult thing to ask. Uh, or for a person to have the wisdom to see. And, um, and, and I, that's something that's really stuck with me a lot. I mean, my husband, uh, <laughs> he used to, he was a funny guy and and he used to say uh leave while they're asking for more you know get off the stage before the stage manager has the hook and uh gives you a tug so um i think that that's uh you know that's one of the counterbalances one of the the really important um principles to test yourself against all the time. Mm -hmm. you know? So, so uh, um, we, we are talking to uh, Carolyn Cantle. This is the CareCast. And um, uh, it's, it's such a wonderful conversation. Uh, um, there, in, the, uh, in the broadcast, we have uh, opportunity for people to ask questions and the questions have been coming up. So I would like to uh, make sure that we, we attend to those. Um, uh, and um, as we do, I would like to also hear from you, Carolyn. I mean, we, the topic of, of our conversation has to do with how do we help care fit in the lives of patients. So as we, as we chat about these things, um, uh, let's see if we can, if we can get to that and, uh, yeah. and see how you see us do it. I, I really appreciate your notion of cruelty expanding to clinicians as well. The, um, one of the challenges, I mean, there, you made reference to why we revolt, and one of the issues that uh, became clear in writing that was that the system is not just uh, capable of cruelty to patients, but, for, but oftentimes cruel, cruelty to the clinicians. And it's not, I think, um, very common to see a patient advocate that actually has enough capacity in, in your heart to include also the challenge of those at the front line. Uh, one, of the, one of the questions that um, uh, is uh, recurrent in these conversations has to do with the notions of uh, opportunity cost, maybe, or the cost of becoming involved. Um, we live in a society where the citizen involvement sometimes is considered just the consumer involvement. You know, if you don't agree with something, don't buy it. If you don't like that program, don't watch it. If you don't, you know, and, and this notion that the only way you can, uh, um, you can have a voice is as a consumer and not as a citizen. In healthcare, there's real costs that are perhaps even monetary, you know, financial costs. There are costs of um, reputation, of speaking up, becoming involved. And people are afraid that if they keep doing that, that there is a personal cost as well, that you get, you know, bogged down and, and beat up and, and tired. And, 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 um, and maybe these are stories that people tell themselves not to do it, but are these real issues and, and, and how do you handle those issues? Uh, I think they are issues. Um, I think, you know, uh, singling yourself out uh, can make you a target for a lot of things that you actually aren't responsible for uh, or that, that, you know, it's not something you can do anything about. Um, there is a lot of frustration in our complex society and especially around medicine where uh, the emotions, the emotions about unfairness and to access and uh, undue suffering and injustice, uh, it's all around us. So when there is that frustration, anyone who singles themselves out can be, be a target. Um, I don't, uh, you know, I think, I think one of the most, uh, one of the partners of humility is generosity. Mm. 
and he's one of the principals of our of our, of our unit as well. well so it is it, it, I, I learned about it in a very different way. Uh, I guess I'd practice generosity as maybe a bit of a reflex because of my sense that you know in earlier life that I you know I didn't know anything and you know that giving other people space and 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 then gratitude expressing gratitude easily being comfortable with with that uh, it wasn't difficult for me but but the idea of generosity really didn't come into my consciousness until after my husband's death and and I couldn't find words to describe the tension that I felt around having this compassion for people who had delivered poor care and precipitated mm. uh, his premature death that the more I learned about the medical side of his care, the more I realized the omissions and uh, failures, the failure to connect up people, the failure of specialists talking to each other, of anyone taking responsibility for the whole patient, so on and so on. But my, my emotions were, was devotion and gratitude and, and, and how could I rationalize this? It didn't make any sense. Uh, and, and then I read, uh, <laughs> then I read a great book, uh, a sociologist from Calgary, actually, a Canadian, uh, Arthur W. Frank. And he gave me the words. He gave me the words to describe what I could not explain to myself. And that was that in therapeutic relationships, we have a, a bond of trust and it's reciprocal. Mm. And there is built into that a kind of vulnerability mm -hmm. that if I trust you as my doctor, the great endocrinologist, Dr. Bonturi, uh, I, I have heard that you're, you know, you've got all this training. I have, uh, I, I trust you because you're, you're the doctor and you, you know, we do that. We presumptively trust, we as patients do. Uh, at least that's the starting point. Mm -hmm. And for you to accept that trust, you have to trust me. Yeah. You have to trust me that I'll pay attention to you and that I'll learn about myself and that I'll form a collaboration with you in order to help myself. And your vulnerability has in some part to do with your self-image about who you are as a person who can help, but also um, the vulnerability to my rejection of of you my uh or and it may be uh the impersonal rejection my failure if mm. i don't thrive if i deteriorate in your care you know i have trusted you so there's this funny exchange of of uh uh trust and and it's reciprocal about vulnerability that binds us and and that that relationship of trust is to me what what relationship-based care is all about and so it, that's that's what feel that's what are you are you telling me that this is what feels or prevents the the sort of this the costs of involvement i think um uh it was understanding no i'm coming it's a couple of generations away from that i'm the, <laughs> the costs so understanding that healthcare is about trust and that healthcare is about uh this this tie we have to each other that this began to explain what i craved from a system that had failed my husband mm. i craved a reason to reestablish trust that that trust had been betrayed it had been you know that that nick's confidence that he was getting great integrated care that was seeing the whole person that that didn't happen Mm. And that, that I was failed in my commitment to that medical model. Uh, and, and what I began to see is that the way to understand my craving for reestablishing trust was really about my compassion with the players in this extraordinary drama. Mm -hmm. That no one went into this with betrayal on their mind. 
and yet the way the relationships were embedded in a system of special specialties and isolation and fragmentation, the model of care is what killed Nick. Forget about the biomedical uh, reasons. It was a model of care that did not meet uh, the patient needs and that did not meet practitioner needs. Mm -hmm. So this, this understanding of, uh, of, of system level failure, not individual failure, um, drew uh, from me this response of generosity. I just, you know, enormous generosity. Now, when you, when you lead with generosity, I didn't come into uh, healthcare advocacy angry because I think in fact, anger is, is maybe the frustration with that betrayal, that experience of betrayal. Um, and it, you, the angry person wants more than anything else to put the fire out right. and not be angry and to re reestablish trust. So I came into uh, the idea of being an activist in, in healthcare with leading with, with generosity, leading with curiosity, leading with, with humility. And it's pretty hard to attack a person who has those attributes. Mm. So if someone comes to me and says, you've got it all wrong, the system, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're all idiots or it's big pharma or you know, it's profiteering off the, it's possible. I think it's more complex than that though. It's, there's there's a, a lot of experience to go around and I don't have that person's experience, but there are ways of me seeing the emotions that get in the way of knowledge uh, as, as having their basis in this trust relationship that's the foundation of, of so, so the uh, okay so so I, I think i got it so the, the the you you think that the there's a little teflon that comes from the way you approach uh, your advocacy um and that but well uh, i presume that the for people that are say that have jobs within healthcare that the opportunity to take on that advocacy, even with the best uh, values and the best disposition, uh, has a cost. I presume that that's where the courage comes in. Well, there's risks, of course, and you know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. I mean, there's something to um, uh, taking a calculated risk and believing that you can uh, you can justify that risk with the benefits. The with, benefits. That, so, so, there will be you. Your words, as as outspoken, will attract others. You mm -hmm. won't be alone. And but I think won't be alone. people are afraid. Afraid of people are afraid of of uh, isolating themselves. And I think it's quite the contrary. When you when you do speak up, there are others who would who would be at your side. You know? Yeah, and I think that that you know, we had a question that somebody said, you know, gosh, it, it can be lonely here, but. I think your your point is that uh, that disposition that you bring, that the charisma that you have, in addition to that disposition, uh, is quite attractive, and I think brings people forward. One of the questions we're getting has to do with forming those communities that end up, you know, not only responding to your call or that you end up representing their voice, but forming um, around these issues, uh, perhaps not in the island of you know, a geographic island, but sometimes in the island of issues or in the in the islands of um, of practice within healthcare. And uh, one of one of the questions we're getting has to do with that story you told about this uh, hundred year old uh, woman passing on this uh, this coin to this uh, baby, and uh, these, these 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 rituals, these tokens, this this the symbols. Um, are the stories that bring the communities together. Um, what, 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 what rituals, what tokens, what stories could we use, do you think, to reinforce in healthcare a sense of community? Which another question is that, saying, look, the fact that we lost that sense of, they feel that there's a loss in this community. The fact that we lost it is not a, it's not entropy. You know, there's been a systematic undermining of, of community and, you know, there's a question about, you know, who's to blame for our departing uh, from a sense of community. So what are the rituals that form and, and what are the things that tear it apart? Well, okay. I, it, it, um, yeah, I, I think, 
the stopwatch, it's the industrial model, it's the assembly line. That uh, is so contrary to anything about helping people. Um, people come in it with every diversity. And in order to understand and appreciate individuality, you need time. And it, you, you need time to, for two people to learn about each other. And to build that relationship of trust, you've got to have that, that learning uh, front end. So one of the, the challenges, and, and I, I get to teach in the medical school and in the nursing school here at the University of British Columbia. It's, it's an it's amazing thing uh, to have the next generation of, of healthcare practitioners um, before me and you know how much I want to influence them. And one, one uh, idea that a friend of mine who's, uh, who's now a doctor in Wales, but when he was a medical student, he, he was horrified when he saw his fellow students begin to see the patient as, uh, as an object of fear, uh, as danger. You know, it, and I think it was the lack of confidence of, of the students that um, they, they felt they'd be judged on their first, their preliminary, their early contact with suffering, with, uh, with challenge, when they didn't know what they were doing or felt they didn't know what they were doing. So, so he thought this was terrible. And he started a project that uh, I've gotten to know something about and I've extended it into a lot of the, the, the teaching that I do. And that's learning how to ask open-ended questions and then how to listen and practicing that all the time, practicing learning skills. So it started out in, in Andy, Andy Carson Stevens um, project um, of, through a uh, plan, do, study, act learning cycle of uh, developed among, among medical students. Um, what can I do to improve your care today? The, the most junior person can go to a patient uh, in, a, in a facility and ask a question like that. What can I do to improve your care today? And then listen, listen for patient values. It's a way of what matters to that patient. It might be quite trivial, but indicate something that's medically important, like I'm thirsty, can you reach the water jug? Well, is it a question that the water jug is out of reach? Is it a question of dehydration and a, a medical issue? And there are all kinds of ways to explore it from there. Um, it may indicate a system problem. Uh, I, can you tell me when I'm going to be discharged? And then the student has a chance to explore some of the system problems and, and the hierarchy and the decision making and can learn through the, through the eyes of the, the patient, through the priorities of the patient. So what can I do to improve your care today is kind of a starting point for learning how to listen to patients. And, and then there are a lot of other questions that I've begun to develop as well. Uh, what's, what's one thing you wish you'd known about this medical encounter? Uh, Don Berwick, uh, the founder of the IHI. Oh, hold on, hold on heck, can I, have to, I have to interrupt okay. you because I want to, I, I know you're going into that, but I want to understand. Yeah. So, so we were trying to, you know, the, the question was really about how do we build community, right? And, um, and I don't want us to run out of time without, okay. yeah. uh, because I think many, many people that are attending and listening to you are, are thirsty for yes, a yes. community of care. Yes. And, yep. uh, and, and, and they, they're dying to hear from you about what is it? Well, uh, I, I think it is about learning to listen, finding the common ground and, and building humanity in those relationships. Uh, if I listen to you, it reflects my respect for you. And, and you know, the power of that, when we get to the medical crisis, when we have the lapse uh, that, you know, the, the, the challenges in that doctoring relationship, that foundation of respect of my knowledge that you are treating me with dignity, the dignity with which I treat you. So, it, so that's not wasted time. Investing in those open-ended questions. Um, you know, what's one thing I should know about you? And listen to what the patient says. That this establishes our common humanity and it establishes a relationship with trust. You start small. It could be with your colleagues on your medical team. It, it could be with your peers in a patient advocacy uh, uh, group um, to have the, well, to exercise these 
a lot of these elements we've talked about today of humility, curiosity, and build trust, build bonds. You don't know where and how you're going to test them. You can't be specific. You can't say, well, you know, here's the small area I'll trust the, the person in. It, it is about human relationships and, um, and, and to have the resilience for the unexpected, the what's around the corner that you couldn't anticipate is based on that foundation of basic human bonding. That's community, building community. Carolyn, it's, it's, it's been a phenomenal, phenomenal pleasure to listen to you uh, today. Um, the, the, the wisdom of, of, of the, 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 in the depth of the, your understanding of what it takes um, to uh, become a citizen advocate, in your case, a citizen patient, and to make a difference through all those values that you've, you've, uh, you've espoused and discussed today, um, I, I think has been uh, very helpful to the people that have been listening and, uh, and to me personally. Uh, this notion that, I mean, you're, uh, I've always had this envy for people who have were, lived through the 60s and those are tumultuous times where a lot of things were built and, and changed. And we have to now recognize that this is a year too that might, has the enormous potential of be like that. And uh, to have someone like you telling us that the job, what the job is to give voice to those to, that don't have it, to get them into the rooms where they don't have access, to be inspired by a sense of justice um, and uh, excited about curiosity, about learning, about dig respect and dignity and trust eventually love um, is incredibly inspiring. Uh, thank you, Carolyn, for joining us in the CareCast and to everyone that joined us in the, in the broadcast and asked their questions. Um, um, while we have the last slide uh, telling folks about our upcoming um, uh, 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 talks, what's next for Carolyn Canfield? Uh, well, I'll be tuning in to the next CareCast. I mean, it, you know, I'm always curious. I, I want to learn. I have no idea. Uh, Victor, I, I you know, I, who knows? Who knows? I, I, there's, you were talking about the cauldron of 2020. Um, these are all opportunities. I mean, we may be, we may feel like they're crises and that we struggle through tolerating uh, uh, cruelty, tolerating uh, challenges, but there are there are a, a thousand doors opening in in all of that and you know i don't know i i just i i love uh i love working with people who are excited about what they're doing in the same ways and it's been uh it's been such a pleasure having this hour with you and uh, and I'm so glad uh, if it has helped others. Well i i know for a fact that you are not going to be sleeping through this revolution. <laughs> Thank you. You either. <laughs> Thanks everyone for your attention. Uh, you've, uh, this has been the CareCast uh, brought to you by the Knowledge and Evaluation Research Unit at Mayo Clinic and uh, be sure to tune in to our next, uh, our next opportunity. Carolyn, thank you so much. Mm -hmm.